So now we've seen a base raised to a fraction, which is just dealing with different types of radicals. So now we're going to look at combining these together. If we have different indices or different indexes, how do we handle those? And when we're dealing with multiplication and division of these things, how do we handle that? So a lot of this is review. We have done this before in own I know, but we haven't looked at a higher index than 2 up until this point for combining these. So the same story. A couple examples just to run through in the beginning. If we evaluate the square root of 4 and the square root of 25 in part, what comes out of this? So the square root of 4 is 2, and the square root of 25 is 5. So we get out a result of 10. But the same story is going to happen if we evaluate the square root of 4 times 25. Since both of those radicands are positive, we can write it underneath one radical with our operation. So what are we looking at? Square root of 100 which is 10. So in that case, it's pretty straightforward since these all were perfect squares. It was easy to evaluate in both cases, but sometimes we'll gravitate towards splitting it up. Sometimes we'll gravitate towards putting it together. We could also look at root 3, same case here. The third root of 27 is 3, and the third root of 8 is 2. 3 times 2 gives us 6 from that product. But again, since both radicands are positive, non-negative uh, integers here, we can multiply those together. So 27 times 8 gives us the third root of 216, which is 6. But this one is harder to recognize. Unless I see it written out like a list of perfect cubes, I wouldn't automatically see this and go, oh, it's a perfect cube of 6. But these numbers are way nicer to work with. So evaluating this one in part is going to be a lot nicer. Okay, so we have a few just to run through. And again, what has to happen for that product rule for radicals? For any non-negative real numbers A and B. So the radicands, they have to be zero or positive numbers. That's what that non-negative means. It also includes zero. Okay, we can work with the radical form or the exponent form. They're exactly the same thing. All right, so let's run through a couple of these. We just have to check, do we have non-negative real numbers for our radicands? Yes, in every single case. And we're assuming, whenever we have any variables, that the variables are going to be nice and they follow all those rules. All right, so looking at part A, we can't evaluate these individually. The square root of 3, we'd have to approximate it. 3 isn't a perfect square, and neither is 5. But both our radicands are positive, so we can combine it underneath one radical together, simplifying it down. Same story for B. 5 and 2 are not perfect squares. Neither are A and B. So we can multiply and write them underneath one radical. I've got 10AB. Then, if we could simplify down, we'd want to, but at the end, we can't. Same story even if we have a different index. If an index isn't written, what index are we looking at? Index of 2 square root. So in this case, we have 3. Index 3, 4 is not a perfect cube, neither is 5. We can multiply them and write it within one radical. And is 20 a perfect cube? No, and we can't break it into a perfect cube and anything else. Same story if we have fractions on the inside, doesn't matter as long as the numbers are nice, which they are. We're dealing with the fourth root. We have to write our index in there. Going straight across the top, we've got 7y. Straight across the bottom, 5x. All right, so a couple for you. Run through these really quick and see what evaluates out. So in part A, 19 and 7, they're not perfect squares, but we can multiply them together, and we're looking at square root 133. All right, part B, we've got index 4, and 403 and 7 are nice numbers. So we're dealing with the fourth root of a really big number, 28, 21. Okay, not a perfect fourth root, not a perfect fourth root, so we can multiply them together. Same story, again, if we have fractions, doesn't matter. We just have to be careful to write our index, because that is super important all of these problems. So straight across the top, we've got 10. Straight across the bottom, we've got PQ. Any variables that we do see, we're assuming they're nice. 
uh, non-negative integers. All right. So the product rule, what we've been doing, can only be used when the indexes are the same. We have to have like terms or like indices in order to combine these. We can't try to combine a third root and a square root without converting it and making them match. So the product rule can only be used when the indexes, the indexes or indices, I don't know how to say the plural, are the same. And if they aren't, we need to make them be the same before we start combining them. All right, so all the cases that we just looked at, the indexes or the indices already matched on our radicals. But in all of these cases, we have a mix. I'm trying to combine a square root and a fourth root, a fourth and a third, and a second and a third. So we can't touch those until those indices match. We can't combine them until they match. The insides, again, we're assuming that the variables are nice non-negative integers, but we need to take care of the indices. So how do we handle it? First thing to do is to put it back into our exponential form, because then we can manipulate those indices uh, better. So 5x, we're trying to take the square root of it. So an exponential notation, that would be the quantity 5x raised to the 1 half, 1 over our index that's written. And we're trying to multiply it by what? 3y is raised to the 1 fourth power. We're trying to take the fourth root of it. So we write 1 over our index that's there, 4. Okay, so we need to have common indices. So when we look at our exponents here, we're looking for common denominators. So what is the least common denominator between 2 and 4? Four? 4. So really, we just have to alter the square root to become a fourth root. So what do we need in order to turn 2 into 4? We need 2, whatever we do to the bottom, we also have to do to the top. Because what are we multiplying by right there? 1. Just changing what it looks like. And over here we already have our denominator that we need. So what are we looking at? We still have 5x, but now it's being raised to the 2 over 4th power. Still one half, just a different form, and we've got 3y raised to the 1 fourth power as well. So if we want to write it back into uh, the radical form, what does it look like? We've got the fourth root, that's our index, fourth root, and 5x is still being raised to what power now? 2. So before it was only raised to the first. We only had one factor of that living inside, now we have two. And again, fourth root of 3y. So we can evaluate this down. On the inside, we can simplify our radical, our radicand. What's it looking like? 5 squared gives me 25. x squared gives me x squared. So we got rid of those parentheses. Now that we have the common indices and nice uh, radicands, they're non-negative integers, we can combine underneath one radical. Still dealing with the fourth root, and we've got 25 times 3 will give us 75, and we still have x squared and y. So we're just practicing those same skills that we've been using all along, trying to find common denominators. That's our key to combining these kinds of problems. We need our indices to match. We need common denominators. Okay, let's look at another one. Practicing with this guy. We have different indices. We need them to match exactly. Let's put it into exponential form. So we've got x raised to the 1 fourth. You're taking the fourth root. And 2y, that entire quantity, is being raised to the 1 third power. So we need common denominators between 3 and 4. LCD in this case is what? 12. So what do we need in order to turn 4 into 12? We need a factor of 3. Whatever we do to the bottom, we have to do to the top. Multiplying by 1 there. Next one. To turn 3 into 12, we need a factor of 4. Whatever we do to the bottom, we have to do to the top. So what are we looking at now for our powers? We've got x raised to what? 3 over 12. Our new index is there. 
other base, 2y, is now raised to what power over here? 4 twelfths. So we have that common denominator, which means we have the common index. So putting it back into its radical form, what is this looking like? I've got x, and it's raised to what power on the inside? Whatever's up top. x to the third. And what root are we taking? Our index is 12. Okay, same story over here. 2y is raised to what power? Whatever's up top. To the fourth. And what root are we taking? What's our index? The thing on the bottom, 12. So since those match exactly, now we can combine those radicals together. And let's simplify over here while we're at it. So what do we get now? Got the 12th root from our constants, 2 raised to the 4th. So 2 times 2 is 4, 8, 16. We've got 16, x cubed, and y to the 4th power when we distribute in our power. All right, one for you. Go ahead and take these guys. We've got different indices. We need them to be the same in order to combine them. So writing it back into exponent form, I've got 5 and it's raised to the 1 half power. If an index isn't written, it's assumed to be 2. And 2 is raised to the 1 third power, taking the third root. LCD between those two is 6, so what do we need over here? 3. What do we need over here? 2. Whatever we do to the bottom, we have to do to the top. So we've got 5 raised to what power now? 3, 6. And we've got 2 raised to what power? 2, 6. Okay, we could simplify and get right back to where we started. But since we have those common denominators now, we have the common index of 6. We can rewrite it into the radical form. And I still have 5 being raised to what power? Whatever is up top. Cubing it. And 2 is being raised to the second power. So 5 times 5 is 25, times another 5 is 125 on the inside here. And we're multiplying it by the 6th root of 4. So 125 times 4, we're looking at 6th root of 500. When we have the common indices, when our indexes match, we can combine those radicals. So more often than not, we want to go in the reverse direction of what we were just doing. Sometimes it is helpful to combine our radicands because it'll produce a perfect square or a perfect cube, something like that. But more often than not, we get cases like this, where our radicand isn't a perfect square as it stands. So we need to be able to break it up into a perfect square or a perfect cube, depending on our index, and something else. So I think it's helpful to have a list written off on the side, especially the cubes, since we haven't seen them that much. Uh, so far, so they're a little bit harder to recognize. We're pretty familiar with the squares, but again, it's just nice to have it written down. So if you want to go ahead and pause the video and write those down as well, or you can just look on the screen, I'm going to leave them up for the rest of this section. So looking at part A, 50 is not a perfect square, but in our list, do we have a perfect square that we can break 50 up into? So 50 is 25 times 2. We can break up 50 into the largest perfect square that it can produce and the leftovers. And we have non-negative integers for our radicands here. So we can do the reverse. We can split it up and take the square root of 25 and the square root of 2. Or we could just do what? Evaluate what is the square root of 25, what evaluates out 5, and we're still left with root 2. Since it's not a perfect square, we leave it in that radical form. We would have to approximate it with a calculator if we were going to write it in a different form anyway. Okay, same story for B, but now we're looking for a perfect cube. 32 is not a perfect cube. It's not on our list. And 32 is bigger than everything from 3 down. So we got to look at 1 and 2. 1 is a boring case. Is 32 divisible by 8? Yes, so we can break 32 up into 8 times what? 8 times 4, the largest perfect cube and the leftovers that are possible. And we can split it up. Third root of 8, third root of 4. And 8 is a perfect cube of what? 
I'm looking at our list. What did I take to cube to get to 8? 2. And we had the third root of 4 left over. 4 is not a perfect cube, so we have to leave it. All right. Part C. We're dealing with a fourth root. Okay, that's large. And I don't have the list written over here because we generally don't deal with them all that much. But, what are my different options? If I take 1, raise it to the 4th power, we get out 1. Boring case. So let's look at 2. So 2 times 2 is 4. 8, 16. So our first perfect cube, or excuse me, our perfect 4th, other than 1, we look at 2 and we raise it to the 4th, we get out 16. So it is 48 divisible by 16. It sure is. We can break it up into 16 and 3. So the perfect fourth and the leftovers. So evaluating out of the radical, 16 is a perfect fourth of 2. And we're left with the fourth root of 3, the leftovers. The thing that isn't a perfect fourth. Whew, I don't like that terminology. I like squares and cubes. It's so much easier to say than fourths and fifths. All right, looking at A. The largest perfect square that we can take out of 32 is 16. And the leftovers. 32 when we break it up into 16 and 2. And what evaluates out from the radical? Square root of 16 is 4, and we're left with root 2. Looking at part B, 80 is not a perfect cube, but what can we break it up into? The largest perfect cube is 8, leftovers, 10. Evaluating out of there, the third root of 8 is 2, and we're left with the third root of 10. Simplified as far as we can go. All right, so let's throw some variables in there now. And we're going to simplify by factoring, doing the same process. But we're going to assume that no radicands were formed by raising negative numbers to even powers. So we're assuming that those variables are nice. We won't have to write the absolute value of anything uh, in the end because we're taking an even root. Okay, so we're assuming that they're nice. Looking at part A, 5 is not a perfect square, but x squared is a perfect square. So again, we could split it up root 5 and root x squared. Okay, and it is a perfect square literally because it is a multiple of 2. So when we take the square root of x squared, what comes out? We still have root 5 to deal with, but the square root of x squared is x. And it's kind of up for debate whether we should put the x on the front or not, on the front of the radical. Because if I write it too close to the 5, it might look like it's underneath the radical, but we need to explicitly say that it's on the outside. So I like to write our number, our variables, whatever evaluates out first, so we don't get confused there. And again, we don't need the absolute value around x, because we're assuming that those radicands are nice. All right, part b. 18 is not a perfect square but we can break it up into a perfect square and something else. Largest perfect square possible is 9, 2. Looking at our variables, x squared is a perfect square, y is not. So if we want to regroup these on the inside of our radical, what's it going to look like? Let's just say I want to group my perfect squares together and the leftovers. Perfect square in that group is 9, the other perfect square is x squared. The leftovers are going to be 2 and y together. So when we actually evaluate this out, square root of 9 is 3, square root of x squared is x, and we're left with root 2y. Anything that's not a perfect square is not going to evaluate out. So part C we're going to look at in two different ways. First way is how we've been doing. Looking at 216, it's not in our list of being a perfect square. So we need to break up 216 into the largest perfect square and something else. So I think that's kind of hard to tell exactly what the largest perfect square is. So usually what I like to do is just take the number 
and start to break it down, not necessarily all the way to the primes, we'll look at that case in a minute, but just into some smaller factors so we can work with them. So 216, it's divisible by 9. It's a nice one in the list and it's a little bit larger, so we'll choose that. 9 and we need 24. So 9 is a perfect square, that's awesome. Can we break 24 up into another perfect square and something else? 6 and 4. 6 isn't a perfect square and we don't have any other possible ones living inside of there, but 4 is as well. So we can rewrite 216 as a combo of two perfect squares and another one. So 9 times 4 times 6. And then x to the fifth. For any variable raised to a power to be a perfect square, it just has to be divisible by 2. So to break up x to the fifth, the largest even power is always just one less. So I break up x to the fifth into x to the fourth and one factor of x. And when we have the same base and multiplication, we add the powers, we get back to the top. So how do we want to break up y cubed? We need it to be divisible by 2. So one less than what we have. And what else? Always one tagging along. Alright, so what could we have taken out of 216? 36, that's our largest perfect square, but we can break it into smaller ones because it's helpful for my brain to see it like that. So what's evaluating out of here? Let's go ahead and work through which ones are perfect squares. 9 is, 3 or 4 is, 6 is not. x to the 4th is a perfect square, x is not, y squared is a perfect square. So what comes out of here? Square root of 9 is 3. Square root of 4 is 2. Square root of x to the 4th is x squared. And the square root of y squared is y. So we've evaluated all of the perfect squares out. And what are we left with on the inside now? 6, x, y. And we can simplify this and actually do the multiplication out. What do we get? 6x squared y, and we're left with the square root of xy. So in that case, we tried to go for one of the larger perfect squares to take out of 216. But let's just say that we can't even see one of the perfect squares. Maybe as you factor, you don't recognize that 9 is a perfect square. Another way that we can go about this, so another way to view that part C, is to break down everything in the radicand into its primes. So another way, let's look at it. 216, if we want to break it down all the way into the primes, we have to do the same story, but keep going. So 9, we can break up into 3 times 3. 4 is 2 times 3. <laughs> 4 is 2 times 3. 4 is 2 times 2. And 6 is 2 times 3. Getting ahead of myself. Alright, so our primes for 216, I'm going to write them in order. 2 times 2 times 2. We've got three factors of those. And we've got 1, 2, 3 factors of 3. So what does that tell me? 216 is a perfect what? Cube of 6. But we're not looking at perfect cubes, we're looking for perfect squares. So that was 216 broken into its primes. And x raised to the fifth tells me I've got one, two, three, four, five of them living there. y cubed, I've got one, two, three. So once we have it in its primes, any pair of two makes a square. Any pair of two in this list. Any pair of two makes a square. It times itself, literally the definition of a square. So how many squares do we have? Got one grouping of two, another one a grouping of three, like we've seen, a group of x and another group of x, two of them, and how many groups of y? One one pair of two. So again, evaluating out, what do we have? Perfect square of two, perfect square of three, perfect square of x, perfect square of x, 
perfect square of y. And what's left over? 2 times 3 will give us 6, x and a y. So we get the same thing coming out. A order of multiplication doesn't matter, and we can use our exponent laws and write this nicer. So whichever one you like to roll with, if you want to break it all the way down to the primes, that's fine, or just break it up into some smaller factors. I think I'm going to stick to this version just because it's a lot faster. If we have maybe x raised to the 26th, it's going to take a long time to write out all of the factors. But if we can recognize, hey, is it divisible by 2, it'll evaluate out. It'll save us some time. So the same story with part D. We're going to do it in both ways, breaking down all the way into the primes and just trying to look in our list and break it up into a largest perfect cube and something else. So looking at our radic hand, constant on the front is 16. 16 is divisible by 8 perfect cube. So we can start breaking that one up. We've got the third root of 8 times 2. And now for our variables. The powers have to be divisible by what? 3. So before it just needed to be even, divisible by 2, but now we're looking for a third root. So the largest uh, multiple of 3 that we can get out of 7 is 1 less a raised to the 6th. And what other factor do we need? So it's still exactly equivalent. One more factor of a. Now breaking up b to the 11th. We can only go down. We can't create more factors because we changed the problem altogether. So looking behind 11, largest multiple of 3 is 9. And if I've got 9 factors of B, I need to have 11 altogether. So how many are we missing? 10, 11. Two of them. All right, so our largest perfect cubes and then the leftovers. So what will evaluate out from here? Perfect cube, perfect cube perfect cube, left over, left over, left over. So we could physically write it out and split them up, writing together our perfect cubes. Nine, it looks like an A, and our leftovers, two A, B squared. Okay, this one's gonna remain untouched, but what's evaluating out of here? Eight is a perfect cube of two. A to the six is a perfect square of we just do the division, 6 divided by 3, 2, and 9 divided by 3, 3. So those were our perfect cubes that evaluated out, and we have these leftovers. Still need to be in that radical form. All right, so the other version, if we break it down all the way to the primes, 16. If we look at it, we've got 8 and 2, 8 is 4 and 2, and 2 and 2. So we've got 1, 2, 3, 4 factors of 2. One, two, three, four. How many A's do we have? Seven of them. I want to write seven of them. All right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. See, now you know why this is a pain to do it this way. And we'll make it extra long because we've got lots of B's. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11. Even my pen's getting tired. Okay. Index. 3. Any pairing of 3 will make a cube. Any pair of 3 makes a cube. So let's see. How many do we have? 1, 2, 3. 1, 2, 3. So how many A's do we have evaluating out? Two of them. How many B's? One, two, three. And we've got one, two out on the front. A times A, B times B times B. And what's left over on the inside still? What haven't we touched? Two, one other A, and two B's on the end. B squared. So we get the same thing out when we write it with our Exponent notation, I've got a squared, b3, third root of 2ab squared. So if you need to see all of the terms written out, we can go this route, but it can be time consuming when we have large factors on our variables. So go ahead and take the next four, simplify those down. Again, assume that the radicands are nice if there are variables involved.
Okay, looking at A, 300 isn't on our list, but we can break 300 up into 100 times 3, or 3 times 100, doesn't matter the order. So evaluating out of there, we get 10, and we're left over with root 3. You don't physically have to split up the factors, we can just evaluate it. Part B, what's nice about this one? 36 is a perfect square of 6, and y squared is a perfect square of y. Evaluates right out. For part C, though, 12 is not on our list. It's not a perfect square. Largest perfect square that we can take out is 4. And our other factor that we need is 3. A, we can't break up at all. It's not a perfect square. B cubed, we need to split up into what? B2 times B, something divisible by our index and the leftovers. And C squared is a perfect square. So what evaluates out? Square root of 4 is 2, and the square root of b squared is b. Square root of c squared is c, and what are we left with on the inside? 3ab. Anything that's not a perfect square is still hanging out. In part d, we're dealing with a cube. Is 81 a perfect cube? It's not on our list. Is 81 divisible by one of those? 27 is the largest. So we've got the third root of 27 times 3. x to the fourth, how do we want to split that one up? x to the third times x. Something divisible by 3. And then 8, again we have to go in the negative direction to the left of 8. The largest multiple of 3 is 6. And how many factors extra do we need to keep us at 8? Two more. So the perfect cubes are 27, x cubed, and x to the sixth. Leftovers, 3, x, and y squared. So what evaluates out? Cube root of 27 is 3. Cube root of x cubed is x. Cube root of y6 is y2. We just do the division. 6 divided by 3. And we've got the third root of 3, x, y squared left over. So let's look at a couple examples where all of those are mixed together. Looking at part A, neither 20 or 8 are perfect squares. So they are positive radicands. We can combine them together underneath one radical. And instead of multiplying them together and producing a bigger number that we're then going to try to break down, let's just look at some of the factors between 20 and 8. Do they share anything in common? Factor of 4. So if I can rewrite 20 and 8 into sharing a factor of 4, it'll be a perfect square. So 20 we can break into 4 and 5, 8 is 4 and 2. Again, any pair of 2 is a perfect square. So we could have factored it into what? 16 times 10 instead. Doesn't matter though, we can write it in its smaller factors. So the square root of 16 is 4, we can look individually. Square root of 4 is 2, square root of 4 is 2. Leftovers on the inside, 5 times 2. So we've got 4 times the square root of 10. We could have looked at the square root of 160, could have broken it up into 16 and 10. Square root of 16 is 4, square root of 10, still a square root of 10 since it's not evaluating out. All right, part B we're doing with the third root. And we have constants out on the front. They just still hang out on the front, and we can combine them together. 3 times 2 will give us 6 on the front. 25 is not a perfect cube, neither is 5. But when we combine them together, we've got the cubed root of 125, which is what? Perfect cube of 5. So evaluating out, 6 times 5 gives us 30. All of that to say 30. Looking at part C, again, we're dealing with the third root. And we have a mix of some that are perfect cubes and some that aren't. But let's still combine it together so we can look at those constants, since 18 isn't a perfect cube and neither is 4. So when we combine them together, can we break up 18 into a perfect cube and anything else? No, so let's just try to break it down. 9 times 2 will give me 18. 4 has some factors of 2, so we'll work with that. We've got y cubed. 4 we can break up into 2 times 2. 
and we still have the x squared hanging along. So we don't have to break it all the way down, we just need to break it down until we can see common factors. And if there are three of them, it's a perfect cube. Okay, so evaluating out. Other perfect cube is this y to the third. Left over is 9 and x squared. So what's evaluating out? 2 times 2 times 2 is a perfect cube of 2. y cubed is a perfect cube of y, and we have the third root of 9x squared left over. So we looked at multiplication. When we have the same index and we have nice radicands, we can either combine them or split them up. Same story goes with division as well. So if we're trying to look for the cubed root of this value, it's helpful to split it up, and we still get the same thing out. 27 is a perfect cube of what? 3. And 8 is a perfect cube of 2. Okay, but if we want to look at it as an entire fraction, what fraction do we need a cube in order to get 27 over 8? Well, we need 3 halves. Same story. So if it's helpful for us to break it up, we can do that. If it's helpful for us to combine it together, we can do that as well, just like with multiplication. So running through a few examples. Part A, 80 and 5 are not perfect squares, but they are nice radicands, and we have the same index. So we can look at writing it underneath one radical. Then when we do that and actually do the division out, 80 divided by 5 is what? 16, which is a perfect square of 4. So in that case, it was helpful for us to put them together. Looking at B, 32 is not a perfect square, or excuse me, cube, what we're looking for. But if we combine it underneath one radical, we've got 32 divided by 2. We're looking at 5 times the third root of 16. And in our list, can we break 16 up into a perfect cube and something else? We sure can. It'll be 5 cubed root of 8 times 2. And 8 is a perfect cube of 2. 2 times 5 will give us 10 on the outside. Cube root of 2 left over. And the very last. The 2 that's not within a radical is hanging out down below. So he still needs to live down there at the end inside of our fraction. But we can look at the radical as one entire quotient. We can combine them together. 72 divided by 2 gives us 36. So we still have one half on the outside. We've got 36xy. 36 is a perfect square of 6. And xy are not perfect squares, so they're still within our radical. Simplifying that down, what do we have on the outside? 3 square root of xy. All right. Three for you. Go ahead and take them. Simplify down as far as we can go. So looking at part A, if we do the division, it's not helpful to us. So let's look individually and split it up into the third root of 27 and the third root of 125. 27 is a perfect cube of 3, and 125 is a perfect cube of 5. We can evaluate them in part if it's helpful. And same story here. We can look at the square root of the top over square root of the bottom. Both of them are perfect squares. And we get out 5 over y. Very last one. Again, we can split up into the square root of the top and the square root of the bottom. y to the fourth is a perfect square of y squared. 16 is a perfect square of 4. And how do we want to break up x cubed? x squared and x. So x squared is a perfect square to evaluate out. We've got 4x root x all over y squared. So if it's helpful to split it up, we will. If it's helpful to put it together, we will. The last example combines everything that we've been dealing with so far. Top and bottom, we don't have the same index on our radicals, so we can't combine them yet. So we need to make those common first. So to do that, typically what do we do? Convert it to our exponential notation and get common denominators. And in this case, a squared b to the fourth is going to be raised to what power? 1 over our index of 3. And a b in the denominator is going to be raised to what power? 1 half. 
we don't have an index written, it is power 2. So how do we get rid of those parentheses? We have to distribute in our power. And when we raise a power to a power, what do we do with it? Multiply them together. So 2 times 1 third will give me 2 thirds. 4 times 1 third will give me 4 thirds. And that's all over a raised to the 1 half, b raised to the 1 half. I have to give it to each. All right, so we've got the same base. With division, what do we do with those powers? Subtract them together. So I've got a, 2 thirds minus 1 half, and b, 4 thirds minus 1 half. Same base and division, we subtract the powers. So in order to subtract these, combine our fractions together, we need common denominators. So on a, LCD between 3 and 2 is 6, same story over here. So we're missing 2s and 3s, 2s and 3s. So equivalently, what are the powers on A? We've got 4, 6, minus 3, 6. And on B, we've got 8, 6, minus 3, 6. So A is raised to the 1, 6 power. And B is raised to the 5, 6 power. So we have those common denominators. Let's go back to our combo of our exponential form, because eventually we want to put a radical in our answer. So we can either do it now and rewrite this as what? A raised to the first, B raised to the fifth quantity to the one six, or we can look individually and do the radicals, then combine them together. Does it matter? My index is six, since it was common now, we can rewrite it. Sixth root of A, B to the fifth. And again, just to show you if you want to do the radicals individually first, we'll still get to that same answer. First one is the sixth root of A. Second one, we've got the sixth root of B to the fifth. Combining them together, since we have the same radical, we've got A, B, 5 on the inside, sixth root of that thing. Okay. Work through those rules. It's helpful to have a little sheet written down with some perfect squares. And cubes, if you have any questions, let me know.